Hey everyone, this is our first video request from a fan. Today we are diving into the topic of deferred taxes. We'll explain all the basics of what they are on this episode, so stay tuned. Also, if you like the content, please like, subscribe, and comment with any questions or requests you might have. Okay, let's start with the basics. So to start with, the net income you see on your financial statement almost never equals the taxable income. We refer to these differences as book to tax differences. Okay, but then you're asking, what are those differences? An easy way to see the differences is a basic tax provision. We will keep it easy and stick to federal taxes from a U.S. perspective. In the U.S., there is also state taxes that would follow a similar path based on their laws and rates. Same internationally, same process, different laws and rates. Okay, so let's jump into it. At the top, you've got your net income. That comes straight over from your income statement. Next, you calculate your permanent differences. Third, you have your temporary differences. And lastly, you apply your credits or NLs the company may have. That all adds up and you have your taxable income. Then you just apply your tax rate and you have your tax expense. Before we get to deferreds, let's take a step back and learn what some of these things are by starting with permanent differences. As the name implies, these are differences that are permanent. A good example of this in the U.S. tax code is meals and entertainment. Under the U.S. laws, you can only deduct 50% of those meals. So 50% of those expenses that are in your net income number, bringing down net income, need to be added back, making the taxable income higher. Other examples of permanent differences are penalties and fines, life insurance proceeds, interest on municipal bonds, and special dividends. All right, moving on. So the next one, and our focus for deferred, is temporary differences. As the name implies, these differences are temporary and will eventually revert to the net income amounts. This can be caused by things such as the cash versus accrual method. For example, you may have generated $100 of revenue, but if you haven't collected the cash, then it doesn't get added to income. Therefore, the cash versus accrual method is a large difference that is usually temporary. Another common type of temporary difference are the differences between tax treatment and accounting treatment. The most common and simplest one to follow is a temporary difference caused by PP&E depreciation. For financial accounting purposes, depreciation is based on the useful life and the method that most closely correlates with the way that asset loses value. Typically, companies choose the straight line method. Under U.S. tax law, we depreciate assets using the IRS-approved Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, or MAKERS. So let's assume you bought an office building for your business and are depreciating that building over 50 years. Each year, you would depreciate the asset based on those inputs. But for taxes, you would depreciate based on the maker's 39-year life. The difference in those expense amounts creates your deferred taxes. In this example, you are depreciating the asset quicker for tax purposes, reducing taxable income. However, by the end of the depreciation life, they will eventually equal $0 together. This timing difference creates a deferred tax liability, or a DTL. This is because you've taken the additional deductions now, but will eventually have to pay those taxes in the future. Okay, so let's do an example with a deferred tax liability. For example is one that comes about due to the cash versus accrual method. Let's assume you sold a computer to a customer for $1,000. They are going to pay you an equal installment payments, one this year and one next year. This results in cash for tax purposes differing from book income. So for tax purposes, $500 was your income. But you know you will be paying a tax on the other half, so you set up a deferred for the other $500. You would take that $500 and multiply it by your tax rate. Let's say it's 20%. So $100. So in this case, the entries would be a debit to income tax expense based on the $1,000 of revenue for $200. Then a credit to taxes payable or cash for $100 for the taxes on the cash receipt. The end of the entry is a credit to deferred tax liability for $100 for the future taxes you will pay. Then in the next year's tax provision, you would have a debit to that deferred for $100 and a credit to the income tax expense for that year. Okay, so let's take an example of a DTL caused by appreciation. So let's say you bought a car for $10,000 and you gave that car a 10-year useful life under the book depreciation method. Ignore salvage value to keep this example easy, but under makers, we would depreciate that asset at twice the rate with a five-year useful life. This results in $1,000 book depreciation, but $2,000 tax depreciation. This results in a $1,000 temporary difference. At a 20% tax rate, that's a $200 DTL. The next year, book accumulated depreciation is $2,000 and tax depreciation is $4,000. That's a $2,000 temporary difference, which equates to a $400 DTL. The difference in those expense amounts creates your deferred taxes. In this example, you are depreciating the asset quicker for tax purposes, reducing taxable income. However, by the end of the depreciation life, they will eventually equal $0 together. This example created a liability. Now the other side of the coin is a deferred tax asset, or a DTA. This one works in the opposite, that you have paid taxes, but you will get a reduction in taxes in future years. 
Now, this could come about in our card appreciation example if our useful life was two years for book purposes. This would cause book depreciation to exceed tax depreciation, causing taxes to be paid now that we will get the benefit in future years. This causes a DTA. However, the most common DTA is caused by net operating losses, or NOLs. NOLs are credits on future earnings for current or accumulated losses. So, for example, if you had a loss of $1,000 and a 20% tax rate, you would have an NOL of $1,000 and a DTA as a result for $200. It is an asset because in the future you can utilize it to offset earnings. While we are touching on the topic of NOLs and DTAs, I will note that DTA should be assessed for probability of realization. If it is less than 50% likely you will receive the benefit of that DTA, then it should have a valuation allowance, or a VA, against it until it can be realized. While not a perfect example, this process can be similar to how bad debt on receivables work, where there is an asset and a contra asset to reduce the value. For early companies with no history of earnings, a valuation allowance is usually a given. This topic gets complex quick. So let's wrap up there. Comment with any additional questions you may have, and we can expand and help. Please subscribe so you don't miss any new content. All right, folks, thanks so much for watching. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you can, donate to Patreon. Anything you can give helps to keep the lights on and ensures we can continue to create content. And of course, helps feed FIFO. If you want to contact us about anything you saw in this video, accounting advice, or ideas for future videos, contact us at patreon.com slash accounting academy. This video is designed to be illustrative and does not represent an official position. We make no representations, warranties, or guarantees and assume no responsibility for the application of this material. Please seek advice from a competent professional if expert assistance is required.